Steve summed it up pretty well. It, Aaron, Veritas Group, um, Steve and Hensel, you know, we're all on the same page, I think. Um, a lot of the talks we heard today and last night all summed up it very well. Um, management zones are the new buzzword. I'm going to talk about that quite a bit in my presentation. I firmly believe in management zones. Um, the grower panel today showed a lot of ways to get that type of thinking, that type of prescription farming to the field. I'd like to show you some ways to make those prescriptions better, ways to make them stronger, how to take those management zones and actually do something with them. Um, so agronomy, we heard this morning from the DuPont Pioneer Group, you know, proven agronomy is a success to everybody's operation and I can't agree more. To make precision egg work, we have to have a good agronomic background. You know, drainage, soil structure, tillage practice, using cover crops, maintaining soil at adequate fertility levels, using proper chemistry for weed-free fields, planting practices and variety performance, weather issues, those are all key to our success and are the first things we need to tackle before we get into a precision egg type system. Precision egg is not the silver bullet, and not one part of it is a silver bullet. Precision type variable rate planning is not the answer. It's a great step to get us to the goals we want. Just like Green Seeker, an amazing tool. It fits into all of our operations in a specific way. But it's not the answer either. It's a good step. If we don't raise the whole farm up holistically, each of those processes won't work at its full advantage. Precision egg is advanced agronomy. It's nothing more. It allows us to make better, stronger, more practical, and more sustainable recommendations than we were able to before. These recommendations should be a continuation of an already well-functioning farm. They're tools we use to make farming more profitable. So I, like, I made these graphs up quickly I've, over the years from a couple different conferences I have, but this kind of shows us where we're at today if we're not using precision technology. So the red line is our current input if we're focused on a 200 bushel corn crop, you know, down in the Chatham area, let's say. The green, or the blue line, sorry, is our yield line. You know, there's areas in the field that are 100 or, or you can argue less, and there's other areas in the field that might be touching 300 at times. So the average areas in the field, you know, we're doing it right. But there's areas in the field where we are over applying. We're hurting the environment and we're more importantly wasting money which is affecting all of our bottom lines. And on the flip side there's areas in the field where we're under applying nutrients. That low spot that always yields, you know we've probably been not putting enough fertilizer on over the years. Can it yield more? If we push nutrients there and build that zone up, can we get more bushels per acre? Ultimately, with a precision egg type program, this is what I'd like to see, where we start matching our inputs to the yield line. So we have very little waste, and we start gaining that maximum potential. When we overlay the two, hopefully we reduce our low productive areas if we can, and we get more medium to high producing areas. Ultimately, moving our yield line up, yes, we're gonna spend more money in inputs. We have to. We're getting more bushels per acre. But if we start farming using profitability per acre and not bushels per acre, it doesn't matter. It's a win for the farmer. So how does technology help us make better decisions? Well, we can measure product performance instantly in the field. We can collect in-season data for more timely decisions using some of those remote sensing equipment everybody talked about today. We can use zone creation to properly manage fields variability. We can begin normalizing yield data using some in-season sensors, drones, green seeker, whatever, to start determining production zones and ultimately when we begin to normalize yield, we can begin to minimize the effects of weather. And we can use these zones to increase our profitability. So this gets us into the talk of management zones and how do we properly create them. Um, for those of you that were in Doug, Mike and Nicole's presentation, it was spot on. That is an amazing way to create management zones. There's a lot of information and a lot of years experience there explaining how soils react, how the different convex or concave type areas affect water movement and soil movement. You know, those are types of things that we all need to be aware of. But how do we do that effectively? And once we get those zones done, what do we do with them? So this is an example of a field. One of my customers I've been working with for over 10 years. Um, I know the farm very well. It's a neighbor of our own farm. Um, so we've got, uh, it's a pretty good case study. So everything for the rest of the day will be about this one farm. We've got corn yield starting in seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, we've, it's all there. Here's a chlorophyll image taken from 
a drone or a fixed wing aircraft or satellite or green seeker, it doesn't matter. It's an NDVI image. Now there's arguments out about sensor quality, but we don't need to do that. What I want to show you is how the zones throw the same shape year in, year out. Some farms don't work that way every time, but if you have a farm that's quite variable, the zone maps begin, and as the presentation earlier today said, you can start to manage the field and get those contours and everything to get the answers you want. Another thing we like to try to do with that much layers of yield is to begin to normalize the data. So once we have seven years of yield, as we do for this farm, we can then start to create zone maps based on that normalized yield, and you start to get the polygons that we can use to start making better decisions on the farm. If you don't have yield, we can do it in other ways, using the remote sensing technology, using some bare ground imagery, using some elevation data, and you know, we can get to that approach, but yield is king. That's ultimately what we want to try and get to. When I know we've got the right zones made, you've got multiple things telling you the same story. So you've got the normalized yield map, which is throwing very precise zones that you can measure year in and year out. We've got a bare ground soil map. You can begin to see the textural changes. We've got the rich organic matter dark spots. We've got the sand knolls affecting on the farm. And they match up directly with the excellent yielding spots and the poor yielding spots. Great, now we've got an elevation map, we've got an NDVI map, we've got seven years of yield, we've normalized the yield, and all of those layers are telling us the same story. We now have a tool we can use to start managing this farm better and creating better decisions. The first step, I think, to managing the farm better is once we have those zones created, we need to find out what's going on on the soil below it. So we can intensive zone sample the farm to begin to depict what's going on on the production side. Is it a high fertility area? Is it a low fertility area? Is it a high fertility area that has a low yield? So on and so forth as we move forward. It allows us to make those management decisions and to begin to apply products in a way that's going to increase our profitability. So how do we put our work together, data to work for us? Well, we apply proven agronomy that works to the zones that we've created. It allows us to be more efficient with our inputs. It maximizes the capability of our equipment investment. We can now begin to use that equipment that we've purchased to its full advantage and to create maximum profitability on the farm and start to get that payback. It allows us to focus on environmental stewardship issues. 4Rs is becoming a new buzzword in Ontario, more than it ever has with the phosphorus in Lake Erie and so on and so forth. This type of approach is going to be more in the spotlight as we move forward. And it allows us to increase profitability. Those high fertility areas that are low yielding, let's save money. Vice versa, the low fertility areas, let's push for more, invest in the dirt and see if we can get some more bushels. And let's start farming using profit per acre and not just focusing on bushels per acre. So when we get seven years worth of yield data, we can begin to start doing some analysis work on that data, and it gives us a really good insight into what that data is telling us. It allows us to look at the farm better, and it allows us to make some really strong management decisions. So we can get a spatial trends map from the software. And what the spatial trends map does is show us areas in the field that are below average, average, and above average. So 100% would be your average trend yield. And it would be in that yellow color. Anything below that is your poor areas. Anything above that is your green areas and your high yielding areas. We then start to look at your temporal stability. So your temporal stability is the change over time that that field is experiencing. So if you're increasing yields across the field, Hopefully, there's a slow change on the upward direction. Things to watch for are these big changes. Compaction on a headland, possibly. Knowing this farm, these are low spots. It's a tile issue. There's a big change on this farm. The temporal stability of that farm is poor because on a wet year, it drowns out. On a dry year, it's your best spot. I, at Thompson's, can't do much to help you with that spot. I can recommend you get some tile there though, because that's probably going to create more profit breaker very quickly for you. Then when we wrap it up, we begin to get a management unit map. And this map here, I think, is very important for anything we do, whether it's green seeker, barrel seeding, 
N, P, K, Meg, Lime, you name it. Anything we want to do to that farm variable rate, there's your zones. We've got well average, well above average, stable yield. It's always high, year in, year out, seven years, it's always high. It's your best producing area of the farm and probably always will be. We've got above average stable, we've got an average stable, all the way down to below average stable, but still stable. It's always your lowest yielding area in the farm. Now we can begin to manage those differently. We can begin to apply the right amount of fertilizer. We can begin to do the necessary things we do to be more profitable on that farm. And we also measure unstable yield. So those areas that jump and twist. This farm, it throws the same zone year in and year out. That's why I picked it for this presentation. You know, we get on a Brookston clay where water management is tough. Guys do a lot of land leveling. You move the water hole from here this year to there next year. It gets really hard to throw a predictable management unit map. Those are, you know, but there's not a lot of variable on those farms in the first place. So, you know, we have to manage that appropriately. Once we get those zones created, we can then start diving into the data. So we can look at our yield range and begin to look at what's going on on this farm. Knowing this farm and zone township, it's very sandy. Aluminum is a problem. Most people don't tend to look at aluminum usually, but aluminum is a problem on sandy soil. Aluminum ties up phosphorus creates issues. So we look at the yield range. As yield increases, aluminum decreases. Also, calcium increases, potassium increases, and magnesium decreases. So the answer on this farm, get some calcium on it, get that aluminum under control, it'll free up some phosphorus, it'll allow the farm to start being more productive. And we need to keep the potash up because although it's a very sandy soil, the numbers still aren't that great. We can then start looking at correlation matrices and things like that to try to tell, prove the same story. So the correlation matrix, zero, not much response. One, really big correlation. Negative is a, obviously an inverse relationship and a positive number is a direct relationship. So same story. Aluminum, quite a big negative impact on dry yield. Calcium percent calcium here, a bit of an effect. Phosphorus, a bit of an effect on dry yield. So it begins to tell that same story. We need to get rid of that aluminum, we need to increase the calcium, and hopefully that'll get us some more phosphorus release and get the crop to do what we want it to do. So once we've got that figured out, we get to the stage where we've been talking about all day. How do we make a recommendation that's gonna prove what we need. Well, we've heard a lot of that today. We can do variable rate scripts using that same management zone map, using the soil fertility that we now know and the productive areas underneath that soil to make better decisions. And we can start doing exactly what we've heard today from many different people, creating variable rate seed prescriptions. But we can't expect 38,000 seeds per acre with an increased amount of nitrogen to perform if we don't have phosphorus, magnesium, and potash especially built up at the same amount of levels. We'll have a tall plant, thin, possibly weak, it's probably gonna lodge, you're gonna run into some problems. We need potash and some of those other nutrients to help support it and holistically build each zone up as we push. If we don't do that, we could potentially be wasting money on some of those nutrients we're trying to push for. So we try to help do that. We begin to variable rate seed in each of those zones. We begin nitrogen recommendations, and then we get into the phosphorus, the potassium, and the magnesium recs to try to keep everything holistically building and keep the approach alive. Well, that sounds good, but by now you're probably going, holy crap, that's like six things across the farm. How am I ever gonna keep track of what's working and what isn't? Well, that's a good question, because that's we're trying to figure that out. I think and believe profitability mapping is going to be the next step for us and hopefully the industry. Um, this is a tool we are still working on with some of our you know, um, strategic customers, guys that are kind of out there ahead of the pack, um, guys that want to try to get this. We're not 100% we're not sold it's accurate, but I want to kind of throw this out there to you guys today so you can kind of see what the next step might be. So this is a gross profit map. It is simply your yield map 
rastered down to each little pixel times by your average selling price. And there's the averages. His average is a $940 per acre profit on that farm, gross. There's areas in the field that we need to do a way better job on. This is the fun tool. So all those seven layers I showed on two slides ago, we're able to begin to subtract off of that gross profit map. And then we put in some fixed costs and some other things that the farmer's willing to share with us, and we can actually come up with a net profit map to start making some real decisions on the farm and figure out how we can make these zones work. So on this farm, you can see this is the entrance. The wagons always get parked there. For a lot of compaction, it's a terrible headland. We need to farm that better. We lose money every year on that headland. You know, do we not put a crop there? Well, that's debatable. Maybe we should plant it in grass and just keep it under control if it's minus $400 an acre loss, right? But if that's not an option, maybe we can just put some seed there, reduce all the other nutrients, put a herbicide across it just to keep weeds under control and just minimize profit. Anything we can save here, it may still be a loss, but maybe it's only minus $100 an acre. We made you $300 an acre profit in your, in your wallet. That's a great increase, because now it's not robbing from the other area because we're, 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 we've got a potential win. And on the flip side, maybe this could be $1,000 an acre. If we can get you an extra 20 bushel by pushing all the nutrients and try to get a holistic approach on those zones, you know, that's another win. So feed the areas that can grow more, save your money, and the areas that you can't. And the areas that you can't are probably already high in fertility. They're low because of an issue we can't control. It's a sand knoll that dries out. It's a wet hole that always drowns out. You know, things like that are ways that we can farm those more efficiently. So in conclusion, you know, proven agronomy practices are crucial to the success of all of this precision ag. Precision agriculture is not a silver bullet to an operation of success. It's a complement. It's an add-on. It makes a successful operation better. I'm getting dry. Um, precision Ag is advanced agronomy and nothing more. It allows us to make better, stronger, more practical, and more sustainable recommendations from proven agronomic practices. So what I'd like to leave you with is start collecting today the data you'll need to farm with tomorrow. If you're going to make an investment in some equipment or things, you're going to need that data to support this type of farming. You're going to need that type of data to make that equipment pay, and you're going to need that type of data to have you know, a relationship with your agronomist. And as we heard earlier, the shoulder to shoulder to shoulder approach is going to be crucial moving forward. You're going to need a good agronomy support team behind you. And it may be two or three different places. It may be your seed agronomist. It may be your fertilizer retail agronomist, and it may be a really strong equipment company to help you merge all three of these things together to make it work on your farm. So, thank you. This video is brought to you by farms.com.